thankful for the way these stories hold on to the lifetime we won't give back. I know these rivers carry. Welcome to Kankakee Podcast, where we talk about the people and places of Kankakee County. I'm Jake Lamore, and I am so happy to uh, welcome our guest on today's episode, who happens to be, um, I be- yeah, the second co-worker I've had on the podcast. Uh, he is, as our boss says all the time, <laughs> the voice of Kankakee. It's Rob West. Well, I have the... Uh benefit of having been around a very long time so <laughs> there is that so uh rob west uh right now currently is the news director at milner media mm-hmm. which is the home of the valley 92.7 uh, river country 1017 1037 96.1 <laughs> and, and, and al yeah and yeah <laughs> and then uh wfav 95.1 fm um, download the apps. Down, download the apps, and not only that, though. I mean, that, that obviously that's central to Kankakee County. But you, uh, outside of doing radio here, you do radio in in the Boston area too. Yeah, I've got a radio station out there that I uh, record some news for. Um, I work for another a, a company where I do a few things for uh, that uh, provides news service to radio stations who don't want to employ news staff. And so um, I record some for a, a six station cluster in Boston, and then I also have a, a client down in Beaumont, Texas. So I'm in Beaumont, Texas. That's where you're not allowed to dance, isn't it? <laughs> I isn't that? I don't know the answer to that question. I'm almost see when, when I was in high school, I was in Footloose, and yeah. I could swear was it Beaumont? It was Beaumont, Texas, <laughs> was the name of the town where dancing was not allowed, and oh. I was the reverend, believe it or not. Nice. So that was against the the dancing. I don't know if I've done any stories about dancing since I've been on Beaumont, so I, I might want to go back and look at that. I'm almost I, I I could Google it now, but maybe maybe I'll Google it later. I could swear it's Beaumont. Um, and then outside of the radio world, you are also a teacher. I don't know. Are you? I mean, can adjunct I call, professor. Can I? I can call you a professor. Mm-hmm. Okay, I wasn't sure if. At, I think, I think they actually call me an educator because in the educational world, now this is over at Olivet, in the in the college uh, world, university world, there are different layers, and you have to attain certain things to be like to be a full professor. You have to be tenured, and you have to have this many hours of uh, blah blah blah. And, and do you whatever. have to? You don't have to be a doctor, do you, or have a doctorate no. to no. be a professor? Um, it all. I think it all depends on what, what the university wants. Mm -hmm. out of their full professors, but they have, you know, associate professors and they have all these other different levels. Technically, I'm an educator because I'm not full-time staff, but uh, they call me an adjunct professor of communications. Yes. Yeah. And if you were full-time, then maybe you would be just professor. (laughs) Right. Right. I tell my students, you can call me prof if you want. I tell them, don't call me doctor, because people who earn those things really get mad when you call somebody doctor who hasn't earned it. (laughs) But I tell my students, just call me Rob. I'm just Rob. So that's what they call me. Now, your wife, is she still a She's still a teacher, She just right? retired, actually. Oh, she did? Okay. Uh, she had her 30 years in, 30, little over 30 years in, and decided it was time to retire, so... So she has uh, retired from the teaching world, although she still does some... Um, fill in teaching work, you know, as far as subbing places here and there. But because of her being a retired teacher and on the teacher's pension, she can only teach just so many days a year now. I was going to say they don't let you do that too often being in the, or at least in the public school 
it, it, arena. If it, right. If if you're teaching in any area, if you're teaching in a school that feeds into the teachers, the TRS teachers retirement, then you can't accept mm-hmm. just so many hours. You know, I was just thinking like we're recording this on a Friday night. Yeah. And this is what you and I do. <laughs> uh, you know, we're just getting wild on a Friday night. I just absolutely uh, love this. I was really excited to, uh, you know, finally sit down with you on this podcast and just yeah. just talk. And especially since you and I we used to, we both used to be on mornings together right. at at Milner Media. Uh, when I was doing uh, the morning show on WFAV, you were doing, obviously, mornings as the news director for all three stations. So we'd see each other all the time. Right. But now I'm in a, an afternoon spot. You're gone by the time I get there. So it's like I get to I get to catch up with Rob. And even in the mornings, we'd rarely get the chance to really talk. We'd pass each other in the hallway. That's and you'd true. be doing your thing. I'd be doing mine. That's true. Sometimes we'd we'd uh, have some some nice. Yeah you know, philosophical conversations. I remember I'd, I'd walk in and ask you a certain question about a certain law or a certain news story. And right. you'd, usually you'd be able to answer, you know. Again, the benefits or, of being around a really <laughs> long time. Yeah. So I had someone ask me months ago, they asked me where you were from. And, okay. and I'm like, well, I know he's from Indiana, and I'm pretty sure it's Rochester. Yeah, it is. Little town, north central Indiana, Rochester, Indiana, if you know it, you've been there. Um, it's where routes 14, 24, and 31 all come into uh, together. So there must be like some truck stops there. Small, uh, there is one just out on US 31, the bypass there is now, but there wasn't when I was growing up. But um, when I was growing up, town of 5,000 people, so very small uh, community. It's since grown to 10,000, uh, but wow. that's because they annexed the Lake Lake Manitou is right there next to Rochester and, and a lot of cottages and stuff around the lake that was unincorporated when I lived there. So little, little town, 5,000 people grew up, uh, there until graduated from high school and then, uh, came to Olivet to get my degree. And by the time I graduated, uh, had a job working part-time radio here in town. And my wife still had another year of college to go. So by the time she graduated, I had a full-time radio job. Then she got a full-time job, and we just never left the area. How long had your family been in Rochester? Well, my mom was born and raised there. Um, so, and uh, up until about 15 years ago when they moved, um, to be down near the good sibling, my sister, um, <laughs> the good, the good you know, sibling, are you, wh- why are you not the good sibling? <laughs> what? Be- because I wasn't going home enough. That's why mom said, you know what? I think we'll just move to Kentucky with your sister. Um, so you weren't coming home to visit from college. Is that what you're saying? Well, once I or, got married and you oh, know, started having kids yeah. and you're just a wife, you yeah. know, and, uh. So she moved within 20 minutes of my parents or my sister. And um, I love that. Yeah. So, um, but that was probably about 15 years ago. Mom's 80 now. So she lived in Rochester from the time she was born until she was 65. Wow. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's so a long that, time. That was her whole life. And dad, dad grew up in Tucumcari, New Mexico. Well, just outside of Tucumcari, New Mexico, a little nothing town just outside of uh, Tucumcari, New Mexico. Dad is very proud of the fact that he graduated in the top 10 of his class. There were nine in his class <laughs> when he graduated. So he's very proud of that. Oh, uh, true uh, dad joke spirit there. Yeah. <laughs> but, but yeah, um, they got married in 1957 and I was born, well, a while after that. About eight years after that, 1965, and there you go. Now you know my history. <laughs> Going back to Rochester and growing up there, mm-hmm. what was what was your childhood like there? I mean, I haven't heard, I haven't heard too much. I think one of the only stories I heard about was when you were in high school. You ended up actually working for a radio station there, right? No, or they nearby? called. They called and and asked me to. So my sister worked for the local radio station, That's w- what it was. WROI. Um, ninety two one, I believe it is, in Rochester, Indiana. Um, my sister worked for them uh, while she was in high school, and it was uh, automated in the evening. And so, the, at the time, they had the big whatever they were twelve inch uh, tapes that you'd put on. And oh, like had, the reels, like right? Six, yes, open yeah. face reels. They had like six tape decks, and you had to put 
tape number at one here and two there, and they had the back announce on them. They were all professionally uh, produced, and you know he would announce this next song, and it would start on this next tape deck. And so she had to. She was the one that went in. She recorded a weather forecast. So she worked for the radio station. Wasn't really in radio. I mean, not the way we think about being in yeah, radio. Right. Not uh, on the air. You're just doing like grunt work. Right. And then she, uh, three years, she's three years my elder. She's my significantly older sister, as I like to call her. <laughs> um, and she, so she graduated at the end of my freshman year of high school. And uh, as she was getting ready to graduate, the owner of the radio station called me, said, hey, you know, your sister's done this for me for a couple of years. Do you, are you interested in coming and doing this? And I said, well, I said, I'm interested. But I said, you got to know. I'm in drama and I'm in choir. And he said, I can't use somebody who's, you know, five nights, in... five nights a week at school. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that didn't happen. I did write, uh, wrote sports for the local newspaper. Oh, so um, it didn't happen. I thought you ended up doing it. Nope. Not, it was, <laughs> nope. And I never gave it another thought till I got to college and I was in a speech class. And at that time, the speech class included a section on radio broadcasting, radio announcing. And so the uh, the prof of the class would bring in some scripts, some radio scripts, and you practiced reading them, and you would put together a newscast or whatever. And and so he he brought in this stuff, and we were doing this. And and at the end of the um, class one day, he uh, says, "Hey, Rob, hang hang up for a minute." And he's talking to some other students, and he gets done. I said, "Yeah, uh, what do you what do you need, Prof Kale, Doctor Kale?" And he says. Uh, have you ever thought about doing radio? I said, not really. I said, I, I, was, uh, I was an English education major at the time. My, my intention was to be an English teacher uh, or write. I, wanted, I was either going to write for a newspaper or... Oh, so you were going more lines of a, a writing yeah. journalist. Mm-hmm. And um, he said, well, we've got a radio station here on campus. He said... Don Bumstead's the the PD over there. He said, go over, tell her I sent you. He said, give it a try. If you like it, like it. You know, great. If you don't, no big deal. Well, that was in 1985. And so here we are, 40, <laughs> almost 40 years later. Gosh, it's crazy. It still doesn't feel that long ago to yeah. me. Nineteen, Not that I was around in 1985, <laughs> but still in my mind, I keep thinking, oh, 1985, that was only like, what, 20 sure. years ago? 15, 20 years ago. <laughs> yeah. 40. 40. Be, we're coming up on 40 years. Um, so you graduate from from Rochester. And how did you discover Olivet? I, I went to the local Nazarene church, and it was kind of a natural fit. Um, I actually, I thought about going to uh, U of I, University of Indiana, not U of I, Illinois, U of I, Indiana. Where's U of I? Uh, is that in Bloom? That's not yeah. in Bloomington, mm -hmm. is it? It is yeah. Bloomington. Okay. And because uh, I was going to go there to follow a girl, and that didn't work, <laughs> so uh, <laughs> so I ended up at Olivet, and the rest is history. Yeah. Well, what was your impression of Bourbon A or the area when you first came here in the the eighties? Well, like a lot of Olivet students, I didn't get off campus much when when I first came. Um, now I say that, but I also, um, my freshman year, freshman and sophomore years of college, um, wrote some sports for the journal. So I'd get on my car on campus and I'd drive clear through down to downtown Kankakee to the journal office. And I'd go in on a Friday night or a Wednesday night and I'd write up some sports. They, they would have coaches call in with scores and they'd give me a synopsis of the game and I'd write it up and it would so, show up. In. So was that a job or just like an internship? No, it was a job. It yeah. was a job. Okay. Yeah. I had done that in high school for my, uh, for, for the Rochester Sentinel Okay, for two, three years. I wrote, uh, while I was in high school, I wrote sports. And um, when people ask who what your first real job was, and I tell them writing sports for my local <laughs> newspaper, they're like, 
Really? That was your first? It wasn't making pizzas down at Pizza Hut or flipping burgers down at the Dairy Queen. You wrote, you really, that was your first job. Hence why you're Rob West. It was making like $9 an hour, which is really good back when you think in 1983. That was $9? That is? Nine bucks an hour. That's really decent. Because that's that's, about what I'm making now. Well, and that's (laughs) about. Better than what I'm making now. Gas prices keep going. It's going to feel like that's what I'm making. Now. Well, thankfully, you don't live, you know, too far out of the area, yeah. you know, or you're in the area. But, um, yeah, because minimum wage at that time would have been like much. three and a half. Yeah. Yeah. It would have been much lower than that. So nine bucks. Yeah. Not that you were working 40 hours a week. I, right. I imagine if you were like full time, it probably wouldn't have been nine dollars. But yeah. also newspapers, though, were still doing, you know, they were in their... I don't still know. A thing. It's still a heyday yeah. thing. Mm-hmm. I mean, of course, newspapers are still a thing, but in such a different form yeah. that it's usually it's it's so second. Um, it's it's an after thought, I guess, as far as pi- physically picking up a newspaper, right? As far as that goes, you know. Yep. Um. So. So that was, was that your first job here in, in Bourbon A or yeah. in, in Kankakee County then was writing sports for the journal? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I, I did that again. It was, it was, you know, um, like Tuesday evening during basketball season and then Friday night or Saturday night and sometimes both, uh, to just taking those phone calls from, from, it's not like I went out and covered games. Right. I was taking phone calls from coaches, taking their words and putting them into better words and, and writing, you know, short little stories about those particular games. Were you really invested into sports at, at when you started writing sports or was it just like, oh, it's a job and I I want to write for a newspaper so I'll just do this? Yeah, not mm-hmm. an athletic guy. Yeah. I I did not I never played sports and I've never dad and I never threw the ball. Dad is not an was not an athletic guy. So we didn't he played basketball in high school just cuz they needed somebody for the team, I think. But um you know, we didn't throw the ball around. We, we'd shoot hoops a little bit when I was younger, um, but we didn't throw the ball around when I was kid. I just, sports was not a thing. And um, it was, it was, again, I was, I was at school and um, the, the uh, sponsor of the school newspaper, which was a thing at the time, was a school newspaper, um, was looking for somebody to take this job. The, the newspaper had contacted him and said they needed somebody to write. And he, so he came to me and he said, are you interested in doing this? And I'm like, sure, I'll give it a try. So that was, that was how I got that job and did it, like I said, for a couple of years anyway. So when you took that, um, or, or you were doing that, that project in class and uh-huh. like doing a radio project and your professor was like, Hey, you should go, you know, talk to the, the program director. Now the the station at the time at at Olivet, what what it wasn't Shine. No. What was it at that time? It was at that time it was WKOC and I think it was like five hundred watts. I mean it was um, oh, tiny. small. It was a it was a campus radio station, basically. Yeah. It it would hit the campus and like a few blocks outside the campus and that was about it. Five hundred watt FM. So it was small. Yeah. And so when you went there to what what happened when you went to the the program director the instructor the professor that was in charge of what happened from there you know i i it's hard for me to remember too much about that i remember um <laughs> i remember i started off doing news for them and uh, of course everybody because it's a training station everybody pretty much did everything but i started off doing news for them and and I'll never forget, of course, Olivet uh, Christian Christian uh, School, and uh, I'll never forget doing this this one uh, newscast that I did. And there was a phone on the news desk right next right next to me, and I finished up the newscast, and the, the person on the air took over doing whatever, and the phone rang, and I answered it, and it was the prof, the radio station prof, Prof Toland. And he says, uh, "Rob, it's Don Toland." I said, "Hey, Prof, how's it going? It's going well, Rob." Um, we don't do lottery stories on WKOC. 
<laughs> now, I had read a story about a, a, a woman who was a cleaning lady who had bought a lottery ticket and, and hit it. And she big, went, and she, yeah. You know, and I thought it was a nice little story. It was a good kicker story for the end of the newscast, but... We don't do lottery stories on WKOC. <laughs> yeah, I guess we probably don't, do we, Prop? I get that because they, they don't like the whole gambling thing. I understand. Okay, right. won't happen again. Yeah. I, I would imagine, I'm sure it's not like that now. I mean, I don't know if they're, I mean, I know they're not as... I don't think they, I don't, but I don't think they do news. No, they don't. I'm either. just saying, like, I don't know if they're uh, as uh, would be as strict now as yeah. they. I, I don't really. know. I really don't. We couldn't have face cards when I was there. I mean, that was that was how strict face it was. cards. Yeah, a regular deck of cards, uh, king, queen, jack, that kind of thing. We couldn't have those. Why couldn't you have face cards? Gambling, I guess. I don't know. Oh. Wow. We could have other cards. You could play things like uh, Uno and stuff like oh, that. Oh, okay. But you couldn't, couldn't play have, like, here's a deck of play cards. Poker. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. That poker, Euchre, you couldn't do that. Yeah. So when you started working at the Olivet Station mm -hmm. at that time, were you in, like, at that moment, like, invested in doing radio, or was it still just like, oh, yeah, this is cool. I still want to be a, a, a writer. You know. Well, it pretty much, you know, they talk about being bit by the bug and, yeah. and it really was that for me. Um, I started doing it and I'm like, I really like this. This is a lot of fun and, and getting, you know, getting the mix of the music just right and doing the this and the that and the, you know, the communicating and I really enjoy radio. We haven't really clarified this for those that maybe aren't familiar. So... Rob West, as as we mentioned, is the news director for all three stations that Milner Media owns, mm -hmm. and you're uh, you're also you play uh, host with Mike Tomano in the morning on the Valley. Mm -hmm. uh, you two talk, you know, yeah, um, have uh, cross talk and everything like that. And I can't remember when Mike was on the podcast, whether this was talked about, but I figured it was going to get brought up regardless. There's yeah. this running joke and anyone that is listening to this and that possibly maybe you're a, a, a Valley listener and listen all the time. You've heard this, <laughs> this uh, inside joke or this internal joke that goes back to. Uh, the days we're actually just talking about when yeah. you started working at KAN. Yeah. So yeah, I, yeah. Well, actually, by the time this happened, I'd been there twenty years. So I was I was about to have my twentieth anniversary, and 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 at the time, I mean they had they had a very generous uh, vacation package. So when you reached your twentieth year, you had four weeks of paid vacation. Gosh, which, that's so awesome. Yeah, which which is a lot for <laughs> the radio is. business. Yeah, and especially so, so, in a small market. Yeah. So there's so there's an old adage in radio. You never take two weeks off back to back because that just shows the boss they don't need you. OK. Now, at this time, I'd been at the radio station for 20 years. I was the longest tenured person at the radio station at the time. Um, and what year was this? 2000? Uh, I'm going to I maybe I, I, I'm so bad with actually putting dates, dates to things. together. It, it's kind of hard for me to say that. Yeah. Um, but, um, so I was the news director again, longest tenured person at the radio station, really probably at that time when people thought about that radio station, they thought about me. Mike was the morning host. He was also the program director. Um, and I decided cause I had never done it before middle of summer. I was going to take a two week vacation. Okay. So we took a, took a week off. We went to uh, Cedar Point, me and the family, and we come back. I have, a, you know, my second week off, whatever. Friday, Friday, Friday of the end of my vacation, I was supposed to come back to work on Monday. I get a call from Mike. And he says, uh, hey, Rob, he said, when you get done on the air on Monday, when we get done with the morning show, he needs to, I need you to hang around and not go out and do your news rounds. Now, my, my routine at the time was I'd get up like at 3.30 in the morning. I'd be over to the radio station by four. I'd get in the news van. I'd drive out to the sheriff's department. I'd look through reports. I'd try to be down to Kankakee City Police Department by five. At the time, I had a key to the Kankakee City Police Department. I'd go in and I'd look through their reports, be back to the radio station by 530, write up all my stories to hit the air at six. 
And then when I got done on the air at nine, I'd hit the door, I'd go out to the sheriff's department, I'd sit down with the sheriff and we'd chat for 10, 15 minutes. I'd go down to uh, City Hall and I'd sit down with Don Green and we'd chat and I'd talk with the police chief at the time and, and do those actual news rounds like you were taught when... when yeah, you instead know, of brow- now it's phone calls and browsing on the computer calls. and, you know... Yeah, and... Uh, or text messages. So he says, I need you to hang around instead of going out on your news rounds because we need to talk with... The guy who was the general manager of the radio station. And I said, Mike, are they going to fire me? And he says, well, he said, I don't, I don't really know. He said, let, let me make a phone call. I'll get back to you. And I said, because Mike, I said, if they're going to fire me, I ain't getting up at 3.30 on Monday morning. <laughs> and he said, uh, well, let me make a call. So he calls me back about 10 minutes later. Yeah, he says, they're going to fire you. I said, well, okay. I said, I won't be there Monday morning. I'm telling you that right now. I'm not getting up. I'm not coming in. He said, okay, I need to come by and get your key. So, so the joke is that Mike fired me. Um, and, and he'll, you know, rightfully so. It wasn't him who made the decision. No, it wasn't. It wasn't. But technically as the program director, he was my boss at the time. So, so that's the that's the joke that goes around. He doesn't like me using that joke. I no, try not hates, to use I try yeah, not to use that it, joke but, anymore. Uh, you know. But that's that's where that comes from. And when it comes to news, how what is your approach on it? What how do you report the news? What is your formula? Clarify that for me if you can. I'm trying to I'm trying to clarify it myself. Um I guess my so my so my philosophy i mean the news is the news i mean it's it is what it is yeah okay i guess it's just Uh, we live in a day and age where there's so much misinformation yeah yeah and and that's that's where my and again i've taught some some uh radio at olivet and i used to teach a radio news uh class and um part of that class was we would do uh, I, I'd use the white wipe off board and we would do you know story assignments once a week. So I'd come in and, and we would sit down, me and my five or six students because it was a small class at the time. I'm like, all right, what are the big stories? And we'd write the big stories up on the uh, up on the wipe off board, and I'd say, okay, who wants to go do a story on those? And so we'd assign stories, and one of my students said, okay, you know, what angle do you want me to take? I said, I don't care. I don't, I don't want an angle. I said, find out what the story is. Tell me what the story is. That's what I need to know. I want the story. I don't want an angle. I want a story. So I just let the story be the story uh, when it comes down to it. At least that's that's what I try to do. Um, it's just about getting the information out, and then it's up to you to decide whether or not what you're hearing. Is. People ask me you know, why I got into the news, and I tell them, because I want to know. What is it you want to know? I want to know everything. I want to know all of it. So, like, back during the most recent election cycle, back in, in 2020, you know, I, I don't care whether you say that it's misinformation or not. I want to know. Let, let me figure it out. Let me hear their story. Let me hear your story. Chances are it's someplace in the middle anyway. Neither of you is telling the truth, you know. Let me let me hear both stories, and I'll figure it out for myself. I'm a smart guy. <laughs> I think I can do that. But, you know, maybe there are people that aren't smart enough to do that anymore i don't know yeah i was just curious as to you know uh, how you approach things yeah well generally in a in a you know in a hard news story there's not time to try and come up with a any kind of an angle at all um and then those those softer news stories about you know this grand opening or or that uh speaker coming to town or that kind of a thing those those stories kind of write themselves too. But I love to have audio in my newscast. I, th- I think me just sitting there reading is boring. So although a lot of people don't think so, I mean, my, my wife, my wife has people come up to her and say, does he talk to you with that voice? <laughs> She's like, well, he's only got one voice. So yeah, he does yeah, he talk does. to me with that voice. <laughs> I don't know. I've heard you do. I've heard you do some voices, Rob. And uh, that's Mike. 
Well, Mike he does, does all the voices. He does the, no. But what I was I was pertaining to, um, like the uh, oh now I can't think of the artist's name. I'll think of it later when it doesn't matter. But um, <laughs> but well, a question that I've always wondered, and I know others wonder this because I feel like someone has just brought this up in passing in conversation, and not necessarily you in particular, but like anybody in the news. Yeah. Do you how do you do you see the world? in a like a super negative like view or how do you do you think it changes just because most of the time when you're reporting the news mm -hmm. it's obviously something that's not good <laughs> you know i mean not I always often, but I, I often tell people a good a good a good day at work for me is a bad day for a lot of other people because because of that yeah you know <clears throat> you know i i spend a lot of time reporting shootings and 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 murders and car accidents and stuff like that. I think I, I really, I think of myself more and more as a pragmatist. Um, you know, I don't have all the answers. And so that's why I just, I, I, I'm a little pragmatic. I, I don't, I don't know. I know people who know things, but that's why I just try to gather information and let's figure it out. Another question I have about news is is what are like the basics of news? What are like the basic laws? Not not well, maybe not laws, but um, what's the word? I'm I mean, who, for? what, when, where, why? That that's that's it. That's that's your story. Who, what, when, where, why? Who did it? What they do? Where did they do it? When did they do it? Why did they do it? If you can come up with the why, um, but that's I mean that's it. It's who, what, when, where, why? It's what the same thing that you learned in grade school. Well, probably not anymore. <laughs> grade school or high school, though, if, if if you had any kind of a class in in writing at all, who, what, when, where, why? That's that's what everybody wants to know. Are there any like misconceptions that you want to like address that people have about news or about, in particular, how you report the news? I guess that's what I was. I don't think so. Was, I mean, I, I, I and I'm going to go back again to one of the probably one of the biggest compliments I ever got, and actually came from Mike Tomano uh, when I was on the air with him at the other radio station. You know, he said he liked my newscasts because he said they sound like I'm reading a story to him, and and that's that's really I mean that's what I'm trying to do is relate a story to you, and so I guess I accomplish uh, at least that part of it. Um, you know, I, I don't have an agenda when I go into a news story, I'm like, okay, give me the information. Now, a lot of times you can only get information from one or two sources. Uh, it's not very often that you can go and get, you know, the person who did the crime, you can't necessarily talk to them. Yeah. Um, and I know sometimes that's where, you know, things can get sticky, you yeah. know, is, yeah. is when, yeah. That that person calls and complains, and I know that's happened before. Oh, and well, yeah, but here's the thing. I mean, I, I, as long as as long as you stick to the facts, you know, I don't embellish anything that I get. the the story The story that you hear me read on the air basically is the report I got from the police station, just written so you can understand it yes. better than than what the the cop may have written their narrative of, mm -hmm. of what happened so really the person should be taking it up with them and not you well and that's, mean, that's one of the things about being in radio news it, it's a good thing uh, news people are at least somewhat shielded in that as long as what i am reporting i'm reporting in good faith i got it from another source and i'm reporting it in good faith and that shields me from from some things. So that's why I I don't embellish on anything. I don't want to embellish on anything. I yeah. I don't I don't want to I don't want to have to stand in front of a judge and explain to him why I did X. When as long as I am reporting what I got out of a, a out of a police report or what you know the police uh, gave me, then I'm good. So I I don't want to expound. <laughs> yeah, I I wouldn't want to either. What's one of the the h hardest stories that you've ever had to report or work on in your time i mean you've you've right. seen and heard a lot yeah I'll, I'll give you a couple of them one of them actually when i was in college and it made me stop doing news for a while 
Um, I got up on a Saturday morning and I went in and uh, was getting ready to do the morning show for my college radio station for WKOC and um, was ripping Newswire and looking at the stories that came across and learned that my high school girlfriend's older sister had been murdered and got that news off of the wire. And um, it hit me at that time that there were radio stations across the region from Rochester to Kankakee that were reading this news story and Dana meant nothing to them. There was just another person that had been killed, violence. And that made me step back. And, you know, you can't mourn for everybody, um, all of those, all of those stories, but it, it keeps me, it helps me to remember that they're people, you know, this was somebody's loved one. And again, people reading that news story, Dana didn't mean anything to him, but Dana was a person to me and it meant something to me. So that was a very hard one. Um, but that must have been a a good takeaway, though, for you in the f- future when you did decide to pick up news again. You're like, yeah. I'm never going to read a murder story the same ever right. again. Right. You 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 again. You can't mourn for all of them because you just don't have the emotional capacity to mourn for every every news story that you read. Right. But to remember that that's somebody's sister or wife or husband or loved one that's a good thing to keep in mind it, that and and I've had people you know I've had people call me after reading a news story and they're like you know can you tell me the name of that person again because I know somebody by that same name and, and we haven't heard from him for a couple of days and I'm like I'm so sorry I said this is the name I have I said I I I don't know if it's the same person or not I said you know so that happens occasionally um but yeah to to remember that they're people, they're they're not just stories. They're people. The other one, uh, this one happened late in my time. Actually, like within a month of the time that I got let go from from my job down at KAN, um, there was a bank robbery over here at the uh, bank at the uh, corner of North Street and Kennedy. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I forget what bank at, it was at, at the time. that time. It, it was either Centru or it was uh, Kankakee Federal. It may have maybe? been a Kankakee, may have been Kankakee Federal at the time. So, um, so that bank had been robbed on whatever night it was. I, I don't know. And uh, in the afternoon, apparently the uh, bank robber had come in, slid a note to the teller, said, "You know, I've got a gun. Give me the money and the till." Blah blah blah. And uh, and he left. And so, you know, I got in in the morning and I got the information from Bourbon A Police and I reported the story and I did that. And I went home and, and again, my routine was I, I'd get up so early in the morning, I left work by about noon and I would go home and I have dogs. I would uh, I would take care of the dogs and then me and uh, and Moose, who was my favorite friend at the time, would sit down and watch TV together. And uh, so I did that, got home, took care of the dog, ate a little bit, sat down on the couch, turned on the TV. And long about the middle of the afternoon, my cell phone rang. And I answered it. I said, uh, you know, it's Rob. And he said, hi. He said, "Uh, this is the guy that robbed the bank. And I said, okay. I said, uh, said, first of all, how'd you get my phone number? And he said, well, I called the radio station. I told them I had information on the bank robbery last night, and they gave me your number. I'm like, okay. Maybe not real happy about that, but I understand. They called the front office. Secretary answered the phone. I've got information on the bank robbery. I'd really like to talk to Rob West. Okay, here's his cell phone number. So my next question was, what do you want from me? Why are you calling me? He said, well, I want you to tell my story. He said, I've listened to you. I trust you. He said, I want to get my side of the story out. I said, all right. 
So the more we talked, the more I was convinced that that it was him. I mean, my first thought was it was somebody trying to prank me. You know? Yeah, I mean, I, you're, I was thinking the same thing. Like, how do yeah. you know this is the guy? Yep. So the more we talked, the more I was convinced it was the guy who had robbed the bank. And so, you know, I'm taking some notes and he was saying, yeah, he said, I, you know, I passed the note to the gal. I told her that I, that I had a gun. He said, I didn't have a gun. He said, I, I wouldn't hurt her. I, I couldn't hear, hurt somebody like that. It's, you know, it wasn't that way. I needed money. And, you know, he said, I've, I've gotten myself into some trouble and he's going on and on. And I'm like, okay. And of course, the more I'm talking, the more I'm thinking, okay, now I've got a problem. I'm a news guy. So I need to protect my source. I'm also a resident of this community. And I've got to tell the police that I've talked to this guy. I, I can't. They, I, they need to know. And so in the, I'm on with my conversation with him. And I said, at one point, I said, would you continue this conversation if I was sitting with the police chief and had you on speakerphone? And he said, yeah, I would. I said, all right, call me back in 10 minutes. So I get in my car, I call the police chief. He wasn't at the police station at the time. But uh, I said, chief, I said, this guy just called me. I'm convinced he's the guy that robbed the bank last night. I said, he says that he will talk to me and you on speakerphone. He says, meet me in my office in five minutes. So I drove over to the Bourbon A police chief's office. I put the guy on speakerphone. We talked to him, tried to talk him into giving himself up that night. And he, he didn't come in and give himself up. I think we had him really close, but he didn't. And, um, so we finish up the conversation with him and the next morning I go in and I relate the story that I was sitting on my couch yesterday, the phone rang and it was this guy and this is, you know, what he, what he wanted. And long about, I don't know, seven o'clock in the morning or so, the police chief comes walking down the hall at the radio station. Now that didn't happen very often. I was going to say. So, uh, it was chief Joe Beard at the time. And he came into uh, the newsroom, and I, I, you know, went to commercial, and I pushed myself back from the news desk. I said, "Hey, Chief, how you doing?" He said, "Pretty good." He said, "Hey," he said, "I just wanted to let you know." He said, uh, "In the conversation that we had last night with this guy, at one point I got him to give me his first name because I was, I was hoping we were talking him into giving himself up. I wanted to address him by his first name, shake his hand when he came in, and give himself up." And so he said, uh, based on the information that we got last night during the conversation, I got a search warrant. He said, he said it was the guy we thought it was. He said, through pictures and stuff, we had thought this was who it was. But he said, uh, we went to his apartment and we searched his apartment. He said, we didn't find a gun, but we found some ammunition. He said, he said, I've got the feeling this guy's got one more big thing in him. And he said, I don't want that to be killing Rob West. Huh. Hadn't thought about that, Chief, that I drive a van that's got my face plastered on the side of it. Maybe I won't do that today when I go out and do my news rounds. Maybe I'll drive my own car, you know, whatever. I said, well, he okay. really thought there was a threat. He thought you. there really could have been a threat. Because that, obviously they searched the apartment, but he was not there. Right. They didn't find the guy, but they found ammunition. Didn't even find a gun. And um, so I go about my day. I go home, been home about an hour, hour and a half, phone rings. By now, I recognize the phone number. I start heading to my car, and uh, I'm talking to the guy on the phone. He says, uh, he says, hey, he said, thanks. He said, you, uh, you, you relayed my story like I asked you to on the air today. He said, I knew I could trust you to do that. He said, uh, I just wanted to you know, let you know. He said, I'm going to do something here in just a little bit, and I wanted you to have the story. I said, no, you don't have to do that. I said, you know, it's not that bad. Whatever it is, it's not that bad. You know, thinking he's going to commit himself. suicide. Yeah. And I'm in the car driving to the police station. I get to the police station. I hold up my phone. They ring me through and go into the chief's office. And I say, hey, I'm over at the police station. Okay, if I put you on speakerphone, yeah. I put him on speakerphone. We're talking to the, the chief, and the chief's trying to trying to talk him in. And, and uh, you know, he said... He said, uh, the chief said something about ammunition. He said, yeah, but I don't own a gun. He said, I don't have a gun. He said, I told you I couldn't hurt anybody like that. And uh, after we're talking for a little bit, he says, uh, okay, he said, I'm about to to do it. He says, the uh, old quarry on Route 50 north of Bourbon A. So, you know, the quarry that's out there. So yep. what, what he was going to do at that time, he was speeding down uh, Route 50 toward Mantino 
And what he was going to do was going to, he was going to swing out and swing around and he was going to hit one of those big uh, rock, big pillars that sits out in front of the quarry uh, there. And he was going to kill himself. Well, somehow, and again, God love the police because I have no idea how the chief did this. He had figured out where the guy was. I have, I don't have a clue how they did it. But he had another uh, police officer who actually is now the chief in Bourbonnais um, that was out there and was in that area. And so this guy swung out to, to make that swing in to hit those uh, boulders, but had to swerve to keep from hitting the police officer. And so he didn't hit it square. He hit it at a glancing angle, did not end up killing himself. Um, I kind of remember this story. Yeah. This I I remember someone trying to uh, commit suicide by running into the um, yeah the yeah. the quarry there. Yeah. I think I kind of remember this. Yeah, and and it kind of brings us full circle um, back to relationship. The guy had listened to me and trusted me and felt he knew me. At least he felt he knew me well enough that I would give him a fair shake. Um, I don't know whatever became of him. I, 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 the, the chief had me write up a statement and give of about, you know, how things had turned out. And, um, I never heard about it again. So those are, those are the couple of news <laughs> stories that, that really have affected me. Um, and, and I, again, I need to, I, I, I try to keep a check on myself, not to become hard and jaded. I may be a pragmatist. I may, it may take me some, you may have to prove things to me, you know, and, but I, I don't think I've become hardened, um, because of the job. Well, <laughs> it, it's, it's hard to, um, I don't yeah. know. It's hard, hard, to, to, hard to continue after that. Hard yeah. To come back after that one. It is. Um, it just, because it was still so recent, you yeah. know, I mean, that happened in the end of December and we're in March. God bless this. Officer Bailey. Hopefully uh, things continue to turn I haven't, around for okay, him. Okay, what's the, as this stands today, I haven't heard the latest on him. Do you know, have you been given updates on um, Tyler Bailey? I've not, I've not checked in, you know, recently. The, the latest I've heard was he continues to, uh, continues to heal. Um, I don't know where they are with that uh, exactly. And, and there's there's also a part of me that doesn't want to pry, yeah. you know. Yeah. He, he's the family's been through enough. Um, you know, I'm sure I could call the police chief and he'd be able to give me an update as to where he is. Uh, but you know, as long as he's recovering, God bless him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. I I hope that he's able to to heal and and I hopefully just whether it's being back, if he's able to be on the the force again, just yeah. hope he has a great life. You know, yeah. after something like that, I just can't imagine. Yep. But um, what I was going to ask you too was politics. Okay. Covering politics. Yeah. How do you cover politics, or what's your what's your policy on on covering politics? Well, you know. Um, and again, something I learned from Ed Monday back in the day. There was a, a there was a, a hotly contested race for sheriff at one point, and I I forget who the two contestants were, but one of the guys the the guy who was challenging, uh, you know, was at the radio station at one point, and he said, "Well, I know you guys are really tight with the sheriff," and Ed said, "Now hang on, we've got a working relationship with the sheriff. If you're elected sheriff." We'll have a working relationship with you, just like we do with them. Um, so when it comes to politics, uh, I, I, again, I try uh, national politics. I mean, that's so screwy. I don't, I don't stay out of that. Well, that's I mean, another I, thing. But I mean, when it comes to that's where my pragmatism comes in. Neither of them, they're they're all lying to you. <laughs> okay, <laughs> just so you know, on the national scene, they are all lying to you. Um, that's what I, that's what I believe <laughs> <laughs> when it, when it comes down to the local, the local folks, the, the people who represent us in the, in the state house, they're good people. They're trying, they're doing the best they can. Um, there's only just so much that you can get done in the state of Illinois because Chicago runs everything. And, and if you, whether you believe it or not, Chicago runs this state, 
the Chicago, the governor's from Chicago, the lieutenant governor's from Chicago, the the secretary of state is from Chicago. Every one of the whole elected across the state offices is from the, the is from the, the city of Chicago. If Chicago doesn't want it done, it doesn't get done in the state of Illinois. So the, the people locally, they're doing the best that they can do. That's actually something I was going to I was going to ask you about is, um, you know, I've actually had some politicians reach out about being on the podcast. And oh, yeah. I, and I've had that same thought cross my mind. Yeah. Like if I have one, I mean, I wouldn't do it in an election year, but no, that's the thing. Like if I've had one on, that means yeah. you have to have like, then you have to have everyone on and it's like I don't know if I want to open myself up to that. Well, this is a private thing, so you don't really have to. No. And that and that's the thing about radio news as well. You know, people talk about equal time, equal time, equal time doesn't apply to news. So it just because just because during an election year uh, there may have been, let's say there's a murder and I've got, I run 30 seconds of audio from the sheriff talking about the murder. That doesn't mean I have to run 30 seconds of audio from the person running for the other person running for sheriff. I don't have to. I was following a news story. Yep. So anything, whatever happens in the course of a newscast is out, falls outside those equal time uh, constraint things that, that are tied to radio stations. Yeah. Since you kind of have an, an ear mm-hmm. to knowing about what's happening in the area what do you think are some things that people should be doing or can make the county a better place just from all the the things that you Kankakee see County's here? got a chip on its shoulder as a whole Kankakee County's got a chip on its shoulder and I'm sure it goes back to the early 80s, late 70s when all the manufacturing started moving out of the area and the, there was the whole last person out of Kankakee shut off the lights thing. I mean, those bumper stickers were still on cars when I first started, <laughs> when I first moved to this area. I, I believe it. Um, Kankakee, Kankakee County has got to get out of its own way. First of all, we're stuck in the middle of are we – are we metropolitan or are we rural? Okay. We got to figure that out. We're not really sure. We want to be metropolitan, but we also love our rural roots. And then we've got to let people try things and fail. It's okay. It's okay to fail. You know, uh, the ARPA funds, uh, the American Rescue Plan Act funds that are coming into the area, uh, being used for a lot of good things to try and make the area better. Let it happen. Don't stop bad mouthing it. You know, they're 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 trying to make the riverfront down in Kankakee something that people want to be at. Let them. Let them try. Don't bad mouth it. Bourbonnais is is working on making a nice uh, a, a nice area for concerts and things behind the village. It looks hall. great. Yeah, the whole the plan looks great. Let them try. Don't badmouth them. Why? Why do you want to talk bad about the place where you live? It doesn't help anything. You're not making anything better by talking bad about it. Let them try. They're going. Are, are is everything going to work? No, everything's not going to work. At one time, there were there was going to be a ra- there was going to be a racetrack just outside of town. I forgot about that. Early, uh, probably early 90s. The, yeah. There was going to be a racetrack. And A.J. Foyt was going to come to town and build a racetrack. I forgot about that. And and people got all up in arms about the noise that it would make one or two weekends a year. And so they took their racetrack and they went to Joliet. I was going to say, that's the one that wound up in Joliet. Well, that one isn't open right now, but hopefully they, yeah. <laughs> hopefully but, that changes. But still, but yeah. that's where the money went in. in and that could have been the coming, tourism and yeah, the, that could have been coming here, but and because it went to to Joliet and Will County. But again, I think that was also part of the trying to figure out whether we're rural or metropolitan. Yeah, you know, the people who live out on the south side of town where the racetrack was going to go, and it's quiet, and we like it that way. I get it. You're not talking. You're talking a few weekends a year and testing. I mean, they would bring out cars and test and things like that on yeah, the tracks, right? Um, and all of it would bring in tourism dollars. I'm just saying. Yeah. You know. The way I, you bring it up, the, the are we metropolitan or are we rural? Mm-hmm. I kind of feel like, I feel like that choice has already been made for us. Like 
I mean, there is a metropolitan, you know, Bradley Bourbon and Kankakee is a metropolitan area, mm-hmm. right? I mean, they mm-hmm. all, they're all in, they, they're all cohesively together. And I mean, at this point, if development continues, Mantino and Bourbon A will eventually be touching as well. Yeah. So. Yeah. I mean, and technically they are. I mean, 6, right. North is the separation. Yeah. Um, or. No, that's no, the it's, school. That's the school district separation. It's at eight thousand north. That's the separation between Mantino and the school district. That ends at six thousand north. But yeah. anyway, the school right. Te- technically, the two the two do touch. They do. But They've as far managed. as but as far as being able to tell where one begins and one ends, yeah. As, yeah. you know, having so many buildings and businesses and homes and. But when it comes to tourism dollars in Kankakee County, agritourism is a big thing. Okay, so are we rural or are we metropolitan? <laughs> you tell me. Yeah, you know, and 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 oh, I can get in trouble a lot of ways. <laughs> I like to say I don't mind like small town thinking. I grew up in a small town. I don't like small mindedness. Small mindedness irritates me. So open your mind. This might be a good thing. The the river project might be a good thing. The, the Bourbonnet, it could be a really good thing. Bradley's doing some stuff. It could be really good. You know, just open your mind. Let it let it be and, and try and help wherever you can. Don't don't be negative. Why again, why would you be negative about the place where you live? I don't get it. I just don't get it. But it's all over the place. You you deal with it all the time, Jay. All the time. You know, <laughs> that people just, oh, I just hate this place. Well, move. Yeah, it's, that's Nothing's what I say. Nothing's keeping you here, dude. Yeah. Move. Yeah, move out, man. You know, if you don't like it, then you don't, ha- you don't have to be here. Yeah. But let's just be nice to each other. Treat everybody <laughs> the way you want to be treated. Yeah, that's plain. There you go. Yeah, coming from, you know, the newsman Rob West, you know. The voice of Kankakee <laughs> County. Uh, I know you love it when Tim calls you that. Oh, I'm just a news guy. That's all. Oh, you're nice. more than that. I, I, um, I am super grateful for for everything that that you do for well, for us. Thanks. You know, and um, I feel like you do everybody a service by, you know, keeping us informed and properly. And I know I appreciate you and uh, appreciate our our friendship. Well, thanks. You know, yeah. Yeah, so. I do too. It's nice. It's nice. I, again, I, I like having people that I know and, and enjoy talking to. This, this We've been here, what, two hours? <laughs> two hours, yeah. Doggone it. <laughs> it just, it goes by like that. Yeah. <laughs> Mike, uh, Mike Tomato, his was like two and a half, I think. Yeah. And, you yeah. know, so, something like that. But yep. uh, anyway, yeah, thank you, Rob. Yeah. So much thanks for having for- me, Jake. Well, that concludes this episode of Kankakee Podcast. I'm Jake Lamore. Thank you so much for listening. Please share this podcast with a family member, friend, or neighbor that you think might enjoy learning new things about the people and places of Kankakee County. The more we share this podcast with new people, the more we're going to grow. And also, a special thank you to our patrons for helping make this episode possible, including Jake Lee, Jesse Arsenal, Dave Barron, Daryl Damper, Samantha Rocknowski, Lake Iverson, Jake Vaughn, Travis Garcia, Jane Bostwick, Don Harrison, Simon Topless, Scott Wright, Carrie O'Connell, Jamie Race, Eric Olson, Jeff and Rosa Carroll, Teague Drenan, Sandy and Steve Twait, and Rose Lucky. Now, to become a podcast patron, go to kankakeepodcast.com and click on the patron tab. Now, if you pledge $5 or more per month, you'll also hear your name announced on every episode. Now, there's also other rewards like early access to episodes, commercial-free episodes, podcast merch, discounts on podcast events, uh, you and I grabbing coffee and heading to the Kankakee County Museum together, and so many other cool rewards. Now, our monthly pledge currently is 
uh, our, our our goal, I should say, our monthly goal right now is four hundred dollars per month, and this just helps cover the costs of the podcast. But also, I'm trying to launch a new YouTube series called Kankakee Podcast Out and About, where not only do you get to hear about the people and places of Kankakee County, but you get to see some of these places, actually see inside some of these cool places in Kankakee County. So that would be the whole point of this YouTube series that we would do once a month. So please sign up for our patron program today. Even if it's just $1 a month, it really does go a long way. You can do that at kankakeepodcast.com. Our theme song is by Lupe Carroll, and I'll talk to you next time. Bye.